and we're now live. And hello everyone who's joining us today. We're gonna to wait a few minutes while everyone gets in and gets settled. Uh, while you wait, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat menu and to offer a land acknowledgement if you wish. And a reminder to those who are just joining us, uh, we're going to wait a few minutes while people get in and get settled, but please feel free to enter your name and a land acknowledgement into the chat menu if you wish. Nice to see everyone. And as you'll see in the chat, this session is available with French transcription by clicking on the link that's available in the chat. And a final reminder to those who are just joining us, we're gonna wait a few more seconds while people get in and get settled. Uh, while I do the housekeeping and land acknowledgement, please feel free to introduce yourself and offer, offer your own land acknowledgement in the chat if you wish. And maybe, could I suggest that if you do do that, maybe you could put um, uh, what your role is at, the, at your institution, assuming you're coming from an institution. Yes. Yes, if you would, uh, if you would wish, you could add if you're a student or a postdoc, an administrator, uh, dean, associate dean. It'd be great to know who's joining us today. I can see two graduate administrators here already that I know. All right, so I'll get started with the housekeeping announcements, many of which are repetitive if you've been to other events uh, this week. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the second KEGS virtual symposia. My name is Ian Worley, and I'm the executive director of the Canadian Association for Graduate Studies, l'Association Canadienne pour les études supérieures. Before I go any further, I would like to note that this session includes a simultaneous remote transcription service, which you can access through the link provided in the chat menu. A new window will automatically open in your internet browser and translated text will begin streaming automatically. On behalf of the CAGS Board of Directors, we are delighted that you've joined us here today. We hope that this week-long series of webinars has and will continue to inform, connect, and inspire you during this unprecedented moment in the history of higher education. The events planned this week seek to address a variety of challenges, opportunities, and inflection points in graduate studies, including student empowerment, the use of digital tools and technologies, strategies for collecting, preserving, and sharing data, equitable inclusion, and the struggle against anti-Black racism. The goal of this virtual event is to provide a forum for sharing information and experiences, posing questions, and building strategies for adopting, adapting to our new environment. Discussions on these topics have been led by, by a diverse group of presenters from across Canada, including deans of graduate studies, faculty members, administrators, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, early career researchers, and not to mention our guest of honor for today, Dr. Ted Hewitt, president of SHRC. Before we begin this session, I would like to make a few housekeeping announcements. I will remind everyone that there is a transcription service available in the chat menu. Next, if you have any questions or comments for the speakers, please feel free to use the Q&A tool. If you would like to pose a question verbally, let us know by clicking the raise your hand button and we can offer you the virtual mic. If you would like to converse with other attendees throughout the session, please feel free to use the chat menu at your leisure. Next, we highly recommend that you select speaker view on your Zoom screen by clicking on the top right hand side of the window. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the CAGS YouTube page in a few weeks. 
It is also essential that we recognize and acknowledge that this symposia is being hosted virtually from the city of Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. CAGS and those gathered here today honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. I would now like to introduce, introduce our webinar for today, a town hall with Dr. Ted Hewitt, president of SHRC. In this one hour session, participants will have an opportunity to meet and converse with Dr. Hewitt, who will provide an update and overview of what is new at SHRC and field questions from the audience through a moderated Q&A session. Dr. Hewitt is eager to interact with CAGS members to learn how the pandemic has affected their research and to gain a sense of their priorities and challenges going forward. This session will be moderated by Dr. Susan Porter. Dr. Porter is the Dean and Vice Provost of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies at the University of British Columbia and a clinical professor in pathology and laboratory medicine. She was the president of CAGS from 2017 to 2019 and is currently serving as the past president. Dr. Porter is this year's recipient of the U.S. Council of Graduate Schools Deborah W. Stewart Award for Outstanding Leadership in Graduate Education. I now pass the virtual mic over to you, Dr. Porter. Thanks so much, Ian. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to, to start off uh, with introducing our guest of honor, Ted Hewitt. And I, I have to thank Shirk for, for reaching out uh, to arrange this. This is a, this is a wonderful um, uh, initiative. And I'm sure there's lots of uh, interesting questions. So Ted uh, was appointed president of SHRC in March 2015 and was renewed in that appointment in 2020. Um, his background is as a sociologist and particularly he's a leading authority on Brazil and worked for many years uh, to foster bilateral business and research partnerships there. Uh, his current focus is on national and international innovation systems, uh, particularly with Latin America and beyond. So. We're delighted to have you here, uh, Dr. Hewitt. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your introduction, Susan. And thanks to Ian for inviting me to be part of this uh, symposium today. I'm really, really very pleased to be here virtually, of course, as we all are. Comme il est nécessaire de tenir les réunions virtuelles de nos jours, je profite chaque occasion qui se présente uh, pour explorer la façon de mieux servir les établissements post-secondaires, euh, le corps euh, étudiant et la communauté de recherche pour renforcer les liens entre la science et la société. Euh, comme vous le savez, le financement euh, sur SH permet aux chercheurs, aux chercheurs postdoctoraux et aux étudiants de développer leurs compétences professionnelles et de recherche d'acquérir une visibilité internationale et de se préparer à des carrières dans le milieu universitaire et euh, au-delà. À leur tour, euh, ceci contribue à la mise en œuvre d'initiatives de premier plan à l'échelle mondiale euh, qui favorisent la prospérité, l'équité, la diversité et la durabilité par l'innovation. Since January, I've visited about 15 universities virtually from coast to coast for similar town hall discussions. And at this session, like the others, I want to provide everybody with a short update on things that are happening at Shirk. But I really, 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 most of all, want to hear from you. I want to get a better understanding of the top of mind issues that are facing graduate education. I want to understand how specifically the pandemic has affected you how it's affected your research, your priorities going forward. And I wanna know what's working for you and what isn't working. What are the opportunities you see for SHRC in the future and where can we really do better? Uh, en ce qui concerne les activités quotidiennes du CRSH, uh, les appels, la proposition et les concours, les occasions de financement se sont déroulés sans difficulté, généralement, dans la plupart des cas. Nous avons ac uh, accusé très peu de retard. Nous avons appuyé les chercheurs et les établissements en faisant des ajustements dans le programme et en repoussant les dates limites. Et nous avons lancé les nouveaux fonds d'urgence pour la continuité de la recherche au Canada. Uh, the fund was announced uh, in May of 2020 as part of the Government of Canada's COVID-19 Economic Response Plan, um, which was about a year ago, if you can believe it. This was intended as a temporary program that helped to sustain the research enterprise at Canadian universities and health research institutions through wage support and incremental costs associated 
with maintaining essential research related commitments during the pandemic. There was a total within these amounts of $291 million specifically for students and research personnel that was provided through existing SHRC grants. This included a four month paid extension for eligible scholarship and fellowship award holders and then indirect support for students and postdoctoral researchers, including research support personnel through supplements to current grant holders. Pour mieux faire face à l'impact de la pandémie sur les stagiaires en recherche, les organismes subventionnaires ont également ajusté leurs exigences quant à la présentation des demandes et au règlement suivant l'attribution des fonds. De fonds. Nous demeurons actifs dans les dossiers liés à l'équité, à la diversité et l'inclusion, et nous avons notamment apporté des changements au programme des chaires de recherche du Canada et recueilli euh, des données démographiques sur les candidats et candidats euh, à nos occasions de financement. If you've applied recently for short funding, you'll know that now you are being asked to fill out more information regarding uh, your demographic characteristics and situation that will help us measure and improve our ability to respond uh, to uh, the diversity that exists within our society. Recent measures in support of EDI and research training per se include the expansion of paid parental leave for award holders, as well as students and postdoctoral researchers who are paid out of agency grants from six to 12 months. Letters of appraisal guidelines on limiting unconscious bias and an opportunity for self-identified Indigenous doctoral applicants to have their application considered for submission beyond their institution's quota. The need for action has been underlined over the past year also by movements such as Black Lives Matter. And at Shirk, we're working to better understand how issues of anti-Black racism affect our programs and operations, both internally and externally. We're assessing what we really need to be doing to address specific issues and barriers facing Black employees, graduate students, researchers, and faculty. Shirk is committed to furthering the dialogue with members of diverse Black communities, listening to their concerns and recommendations, and learning about best practices. De même, Nous nous efforçons de mettre en œuvre de nouvelles politiques et pratiques liées à la recherche autochtone au moyen d'une nouvelle politique interorganisme intitulée « Établir de nouvelles orientations à l'appui de la recherche et de la formation en recherche autochtone ». Conçue en collaboration avec des partenaires autochtones, cette politique vise à garantir le soutien de la recherche autochtone par les trois organismes subventionnaires. Elle vise aussi à s'assurer que la recherche autochtone est menée par et avec les communautés autochtones et qui elles reflètent les modes de connaissance uh, autochtones uh, et qui des membres des communautés autochtones participent à l'évaluation de mérite des projets axés sur la recherche autochtone. Finally, we're working very hard to ensure that your voices are clearly heard at all levels of government. The demand for social sciences and humanities research and talent to inform public policy continues to grow. We have new partnerships with government departments, including the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, Global Affairs, the Future Skills Centre, Infrastructure Canada, Canadian Heritage, and the, Canadian, the Canada School of Public Service over the last six months alone. And these are a testament to our proactive and responsive engagement with stakeholders in positioning the value of SHRC-funded research and talent. One, one of the best examples I can think of, and I'm sure would interest you, is SHRC's International Policy Ideas Challenge in, partnerships with, in partnership with Global Affairs Canada, which trains students to identify concrete and groundbreaking solutions to emerging international challenges. The program lets applicants test their skills in translating academic expertise into policy language and insights to strengthen the potential impact of their work. Anyone in the audience interested in pursuing opportunities through SHRC of these or other kinds should know that we provide funding under the Talent, Insight and Connections programs. The Talent program is likely the most relevant for this audience with a goal of supporting students and postdoctoral researchers, but there are also tri-agency programs available to support research training directly via indirect support through grants. I should note that uh, given the uncertainty over pandemic restrictions for the foreseeable future, at least we're providing flexibility to applicants in upcoming competitions. Applicants have the option to include contingency plans and impacts on their careers 
related to COVID-19 within their application. So please make sure you do that as this is gonna help you and all applicants to explain the impacts of the pandemic uh, and what uh, uh, the impacts of, uh, of the pandemic has had on their research, their professional career, uh, their record of academic or research achievement or completion of degrees. Shirk's focus for the future is to further build the capacity of our talented and dedicated research community as outlined in our strategic plan momentum 2020-2022, uh, which we are just in process of extending to 2024. If you haven't had a chance to look at that, uh, please do uh, have, a, have a look on our website, download it, and uh, we'd be pleased to receive your, your input on that process. So I'm going to stop there. I think I've spoken uh, certainly enough to kind of give a sense of things that are happening at Shirk these days. Happy to talk about uh, budget 2021 and where we're going in terms of the future of uh, research and research support uh, for training as we move forward, or simply to hear you know, your experiences and to learn a little bit better about uh, some of the uh, challenges that you're facing in this pandemic era. So Susan, I'm gonna turn it, and Ian, I'm gonna turn it back to you. And I'm happy to respond to comments and questions at the deux langues officielles as you wish to uh, moderate. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks so much, uh, Ted. Let me, Ian, if I could just maybe while people are getting ready for their to put their questions in, maybe I could just start it off. Mm -hmm. um, I probably on the top of everyone's mind is uh, looking at the uh, the federal mounting deficit um, with your uh, long range glasses. Where do you see uh, research funding coming in? Well, it's interesting, and I think as someone characterized budget 2021 to me, you know, this was really the applied research budget. Uh, you'll notice that there were billions of dollars in funding in areas, you know, from clinical research to biomanufacturing and artificial intelligence and quantum, all of which have uh, implications for, for social sciences and humanities. Um, but it, it's a, a, a big, big, big investment. Interestingly, you know, a lot of that will benefit training uh, because in all of the instances that I'm aware of, there is funding available for training for students, for example, in the biomanufacturing initiatives and clinical trials and so forth. So I think there will be some significant benefit there aside from, you know, the, the investments in my tax um, and, the, in, in, and the changes that were made to student loans, which I know uh, many, many folks are, are relying on, uh, even at the graduate level. So it's, it's, it's good news uh, all around. And, and the other thing you may not be aware of, before I get to the, uh, the, the hill, <laughs> the other thing you may not be aware of is the funding that was provided uh, by the federal government in 2018 for, for fundamental research and in 2019, uh, for training, that money is still coming in. It, it was set to ramp up year over year over year. So we're receiving more money each year from those initial investments. So, so far, so good. Have we heard, you know, what's coming? You know, are people saying, start tightening your belt? You know, are we hearing, um, you know, that we better, uh, you know, keep an eye on, on where the federal deficit is going? And the answer is just simply no. Uh, I think the government recognizes it needed to make some investments in more applied uh, types of research uh, and to support the Canadian economy. Um, I think uh, the government has a very strong record in supporting fundamental research. Uh, I don't think that's going to go away. I think the economy and most people are suggesting the economy, you know, will be in good shape when we move uh, forward. So I'm trying to remain optimistic, number one. And number two, I have absolutely no uh, indication, suggestion, warning, um, hunches that otherwise to suggest otherwise, and that in fact, uh, you know, we need to be watching uh, government trends in the years ahead. Research and training will always be important, I think, to governments. One thing I can tell you just before I move off this is that, you know, when I first met with Minister Champagne, uh, the first thing he talked about was training and students. That was the first thing that came out of his mouth. Uh, and this was about uh, six weeks ago. So I think uh, just after he was appointed six or eight weeks ago. So I think, you know, this signals that government, you know, still holds these things to be, to be very important. And those investments should continue. So well, I just want to, thanks. I just want to note that uh, I've, I'm promoting everyone to panel. So we have a good size group here to do a, a, a meeting style. So we don't need to do the webinar style. So uh, if you'd like to uh, turn your camera on or, or your microphone, please feel free to do so. Um, and I'll be promoting everyone to panelists one by one now.
Yeah, if you can turn on your camera as well, if you have a question, that would be awesome. But uh, certainly that's completely up to you. Well, can I ask one other question then while we're still waiting for <laughs> questions? I had, I can, sure. I can. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of prognosticators about the world post COVID. Uh, lots of um, people looking into the future accurately or not. Um, have you done that? And if so, what, what do you see? How do you see the world would be different, particularly for social sciences and humanities post COVID? So uh, a couple of things. Um, one interesting thing is with respect to tools and methodologies, what we're seeing is that people are really resorting to some in quite innovative approaches <laughs> to be able to do their work. Uh, and in fact, Shirk launched a consultation just this year on the kinds of tools that social scientists and humanists are starting to use more frequently. We all think about computers and digital humanities and that's all, you know, very correct. Uh, but, you know, people uh, relying on, you know, 3D printing, you know, to yes, be able to yeah. create models and, and to see visualize models, even remotely, if people have 3D printers. Um, lots of talk about bandwidth, <coughs> excuse me, uh, connectivity, um, meeting through Zoom and other platform technologies, because they can't get into communities to do that work, particularly in the North, but generally in Canada. So that's been been something else we're seeing uh, more often. Uh, and, and really what we're paying very close attention to and what I don't totally have every answer to is uh, trying to monitor and better understand, you know, how people are coping on the day to day, you know, with all of the things they need to do. If you're a grad student, you're, you're a TA, you're trying to do your research, you're taking courses. Uh, and, and, you know, we really need to understand how that's affecting you and your ability to finish your degree and what kind of needs you have. Uh, so uh, that's an ongoing uh, effort. We have a number of quantitative studies uh, that we're using, and the agencies are in fact collecting data with, uh, from applicants with respect to this. We also have some international data, but just hearing from you even today about that would be would be amazing. So, otherwise, other than that, uh, I would say Susan, international research, you know, that's moving along just a pace because we don't know. We no longer have to fly to you know France or to Brazil or wherever. And I just did a meeting with Brazil on. Uh, Wednesday, uh, three hours in the afternoon, uh, we met with France and the UK to talk about research training and research collaboration, three hour sessions uh, last month. Uh, so this is really, really flying along and we have new programs to support that, not just as SHRC, but uh, as Tri-Council also. And then I would say lastly, you know, the way people are working together in very sophisticated ways across disciplines is just really phenomenal. We created the New Frontiers in Research Fund to be able to promote that further, to get people right, you know, out of the out of the sandbox, you know, right into outer space, you know, to start thinking about things they could do that no agency would ever fund. I mean, that is the basis of the New Frontiers uh, Fund, and uh, is for people to apply for things that they would never have dared to apply to an existing funding agency for. And we're just seeing some just incredible projects that cross boundaries, you know, like, like crazy. And we're doing some analysis of that also. So that would be my, my, my quick answer, because there's so much going on right now. I, as you talk, I'm, I'm sure there's a huge uh, opportunity to understand from the social science and humanities perspective, to understand how this new way of communicating with each other changes how we, how we communicate. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, research participants. What does it mean to do that virtually. I'm thinking of third world countries where there's so inequitable access to, to um, technology that you're going to change the way you understand them if, if you're going to rely on that, right? Absolutely. And, you know, some of these meetings, I, I was attending a UN meeting on the UN Research Roadmap, which we support at SHRC with CIHR. We had, we had participants from all over the world, literally. Uh, and, uh, and some of the bandwidth issues, you know, weren't occurring in Africa and Asia. They were, you know, occurring in Toronto. You know, or Washington, it was quite, quite fine. I'm still inequities. But, <laughs> there you go. Uh, but they, they were at places that could well have afforded, you know, better, better service. But the, the point is that this is becoming easier. It's becoming more common and opening doors like have never been opened uh, before. If you have a chance, if everybody has a chance, you know, please do go to our Shirk website. We have a perspectives page on COVID where a lot of the research uh, that's being done on COVID and the impact of COVID we're highlighting. Uh, for folks to have a look and see what's being done uh, there. So there's actually the perspectives page, and then we have a dashboard that talks about, you know, what we're funding, who we're funding, how we're funding that, and how we're supporting that.
Thanks, I'd like, I'd like to leave some time for participants here. <laughs> Ian, is there uh, <clears throat> any hands up or anything? No, I think uh, we're still in the ice breaking phase, perhaps. <laughs> um, well, but, you know, if, if everything is going so well, that's right. That's right. <laughs> guys. My job is done. You know, yes. I, I think you know there. I mean, I could stimulate you know questions around things like, well, I'll tell you something, and then maybe you, I'll tell you one more thing I didn't mention, um, and this isn't you know totally public yet, but so you'll be among the first to know. But the we are as agencies undertaking an evaluation of the training portfolio across the agencies, broadly speaking, uh, for the first time, looking at direct support for training for, this is student related, we call it training, but it's student related, um, uh, indirect and direct support. We haven't done that in the past. So we've just started uh, to have a look at that and to try and understand you know, how programs are organized, how effective they are, what the issues are. For example, you know, what, what is graduate funding supposed to achieve? Are, are we supposed to be funding research? Are we funding uh, you know, a living wage? Very important questions. How much, how much money is left for actually doing research uh, given the size of grants, you know, that currently we're, we're handing out. And that's the next question, you know, are, is the support that we're providing enough? Um, obviously, everybody will say it should be more, but this is a finite world. You know, you make grants bigger, you fund fewer people. You know, who, who should our partners be in funding? Um, and, and questions like these, and the, the will all be part of this evaluation, and there will be a consultation that will be occurring um, as this moves along. The other piece is that the Canada Research Coordinating Committee has taken this up also. So we'll be doing two things at once. CRCC will be looking at this as the evaluation is ongoing to try and have a really hard look at whether the system is working, whether it's working well, and what kind of changes uh, we could make to make it better. So if that doesn't kind of shake people up a little bit, you know, I don't think anything is. So I'd just love to hear about, you know, what's working, what's not working, what we'd better pay attention to, you know, as we move along. Well, one immediate question is how are you going to measure or how are you going to evaluate what a positive outcome is? Well, they, our evaluation folks are brilliant. If you've ever dealt with them before, they, they will set out the parameters for that and they will set out the measures that will indicate you know, wh whether or not success or what level of success has been achieved. So I can't go into the details right now, but that is part of the evaluation and, uh, and how it's done. On the other hand, um, it's important that as we do move forward with our consultation efforts and people do have input into these processes that they help us, you know, precisely to understand what you consider to be success versus what we might consider uh, to be success. So that's all part of the evaluation process. No preconceived notions here. That's in this case, we want to, we want to open the whole thing up and have a look. Ted, one thing that I've uh, seen in some of the graduate student uh, forums I follow um, is this sense that there's going to be a huge gap in their CV from what they didn't get to do last year, especially folks, you know, field biologists and, and people working, you know, on projects that just could not happen. Uh, interviews uh, with, uh, you know, psychology interviews, uh, those types of things that they just could not do or, or were able to do only virtually. Um, is there any sense that this kind of missing year, if you will, or this, this, uh, this reduction in pr uh, productivity will be factored in in future scholarship uh, adjudications, considerations, panels, whatnot, or is this, um, is this something they just have to work through over the next few years? So, so we're trying to deal with this in a couple of ways. One, I already mentioned you know, in my opening comments that you know, we really wanna know how you've been impacted uh, to date and how your work will be impacted in the future in your view. This is going to be baked into the peer review process so that reviewers, you know, are going to have in their head uh, a notion that they must, you know, take these factors into account when they're assessing productivity to date and assessing future, future uh, research plans or training plans. So that's a big piece of that. Um, I think the other piece, you know, has to do with the data we collect because we're watching very carefully right now uh, as we move through our competitions. So, so far we've done our insight, I think insight development, we have data, demographic data uh, that corresponds to the stat can categories. We've started to analyze that in terms of rates of application, rates of success across all the communities that we monitor to see whether or not, for example, you know, are we receiving you know, a, a proportionate number of application 
from uh, persons of, of color or from indigenous students or from indigenous applicants? Are their success rates commensurate with other success rates? I can tell you that you know our record at Shirk is not too bad from the from the preliminary analysis that we've been doing. It's pretty good, um, but uh, if we see, for example, in those data that we're not getting the applications or the success rates are varying, uh, in accordance with some of the parameters that we understand, uh, women, for example, if the burden of of needing to look after families or to care for for children, you know, is affecting their ability to apply, we would see that. The issue is you, you only get a generic uh, picture of that. You, know, you, you don't see the people, even if, even if our application rates were the same as they were last year. So we get about, if I'm not mistaken, 52% of our applicants are women or, or higher. Uh, if 52% of our applicants are women this year, one could easily conclude, oh, okay, well, everything's cool. Don't worry about it. Like, you know, they're applying. We can just forget about it. Problem is you don't see the minority that are in there um, who, who didn't apply because perhaps other women, you know, were able to, uh, to become more productive. So we, we need to kind of drill down. It has to be an intersectional approach as well uh, to see, you know, where the issues are and who's there and who's not, and then try and accommodate to future programming uh, to, to correct that. So those are two ways, at least, we hope to deal with that. We, we will have a bit more funding um, in place uh, through the Canada Research Coordinating Committee uh, around the pandemic as a way to mitigate some of the issues uh, that's coming. So I would just say, stay tuned for that. That particularly should affect uh, postdoctoral fellows. Um, I'll just give you that little tantalizing hint there. Um, but uh, for the most part, we're still in process of processing, you know, the data and the information we're getting and including through sessions like this and the, and the, and the town halls that I'm doing. We do have a kind of follow up to that from uh, from Jane Rennie. Um, if uh, these considerations will cover delay to complete degree requirements for the adjudication instructions for committee members. Um, well, it would absolutely. Now, of course, you know what happens within the institution is up to the institution, right? I mean, in terms of, of how that works, let's be clear. But in terms of our funding and your and your stage. Uh, within that, yes, absolutely, you'll be able to explain that or provide further information on that so that reviewers can take that into account. That's a really good question. First thing I'd be thinking of for sure, if I were in that role. So um, I have another question, unless there's other ones out there that I'm missing. I mean, I have, I could probably ask questions until. Also, I'll try and be more <laughs> but controversial. I don't, but I don't want to. Um, <laughs> and, and forgive me if this is something I should know when I'm looking at Julie in there who, who would know the answer to this too. But are you or are you planning to uh, compile racial data? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we use the StatCan categories. Uh, so that is broken down to very fine uh, categories that we use and people, it's voluntary, but we have about a 95% compliance, 97% compliance rate, which is awesome. It helps us so much. And then we can do that cross-sectional or intersectional analysis also. And, so we can look at so black women or we can look at, at indigenous okay. men. So that's all happening. So we do have so that. We have on, two years. On, okay. So that's on, on scholarship, fellowship applications. And it's or? on everything. Uh, as I understand it. So when you, when you apply, you'll be doing that regardless. So if, if I'm wrong, Darlene is going to check that for me, but I'm 99% sure. And somebody's asking, you know, is it kept within the Tri-Council? Right now it is. It's our data because it's, it's, it's fairly recent. Uh, so we want to have a look at it first, understand what's happening and to make use of it initially. But uh, the plan is that it will become available very likely in aggregate. Uh, so uh, unless you're doing research with it, which you could, um, you know, and we would be willing to share it, uh, we're going to provide that uh, in tranches or in packets, you know, that will be based on uh, aggregate uh, so that we respect uh, privacy rights to the extent possible. Another question in the chat there from, uh, looks like Vidi. Yes, hi, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. The perspectives paper online looks fantastic. I was just wondering, where do you see the future of research and also opportunities for postdocs and early career investigators? 
Okay, well, I ha having some of these people in my house, um, I'm seeing it pretty up front <laughs> and center these days. Um, and, you know, I want to be hopeful. And I think we have to work very hard to ensure that opportunities, you know, are in place, because I think we would all agree uh, that with the current situation, with the situation faced by universities in terms of funding, um, you know, in terms of, of jobs within the academy, things are definitely getting tighter uh, than, than they have been. On the other hand, the federal government has been certainly working hard, and this is not a plug, you know, for my employer, but federal government, I think, has been working fairly hard through the budget increases since 2018, uh, and particularly the emergency funding that was provided uh, this past year to try and support students, at least in the short term. I think where we have to start thinking is how we're going to provide longer term help. So a good example is in for, uh, uh, is, is Shirk's uh, postdoctoral fellowship program. Um, I think if I have the numbers right, uh, we have a success rate there that's under 20%, which is really, in my view, not acceptable. And that's because you know, it's only 20 because we've been putting more money into it every year uh, from other sources in order to try and promote that. We do know that some postdocs are employed through grants, but not to the extent uh, that that would occur, uh, certainly in, say, NSERC or in CIHR. That's part of the reason, by the way, we're doing uh, the, uh, uh, the talent, so-called talent reviews to try and better understand that. So I think we can do better there. Uh, my, my view uh, is certainly that uh, we could do better with doctoral and master's support uh, than we do. Although, you know, from the latest data that I saw, you know, the numbers that we're providing support to, certainly at the doctoral level is not too, too, too terrible, but it's not exactly uh, phenomenal either. So, you know, we need to go back to government. You know, we need to make the case, particularly in this environment, uh, that we need to support our students and our postdocs if we want to ensure they bridge the gap here between um, what the system is producing and the institution's ability to absorb those. And I know this is CAGS, and I know you'll want me to say that, of course, not every student is graduating to become a university professor. Um, so I think that becomes the other part of our obligation. And some of that is now being addressed through the new funding that was announced by government in budget 2021, uh, because these are mostly, but not exclusively in science areas. So when you think about clinical trials or biomanufacturing or AI, uh, or um, uh, uh, I can't remember, just, I'm having a uh, brain seizure here, quantum computing, right? Um, these have huge social implications, these things, uh, certainly quantum computing and AI. So there's room for everybody there. These funds that were made available um, recently by government to support that, a portion of those will be dedicated to training, particularly doctor level training and postdocs. And we know MyTax had an unprecedented investment over $800 million, as I recall. Uh, so we know MyTax is going to play a key role on this in terms of the gap. For the larger system, I think we all have to have the, the conversation, and I think we're all beginning to realize that uh, we need to make sure uh, that the system is able to thrive, that the graduates that are being produced can find a place you know, in our society uh, to contribute effectively. So this is a bigger issue that we all need to, to start having a conversation on. Great, thank you. Somebody's so asking. We, we've been having that conversation for quite a while. I oh, know. I've been here. I've been here. I've been here since I don't know how long. 2014. <laughs> Somebody's asking about programs you can apply directly to Shirk for as a as a PhD student. Um, I, I think I'm going to say the answer is no. Uh, that uh, those uh, applications. I mean, you're applying to Shirk obviously for a Shirk doctoral fellowship, but it's going through your institution. Your institution is managing the flow of those. Um, if you were to apply, you certainly could apply not as a co-applicant, but you can certainly be part of a project, but the applicant would have to be um, uh, considered an eligible uh, applicant by SHRC and by the institution, so usually a, a prof. If you're a postdoc, uh, some people don't realize you can apply directly for SHRC programming, any, anything uh, that's available to anybody else, a postdoc can apply. Um, the issue is whether or not your institution will allow you uh, to do that because they're the ones that will have to manage the, the grant. Some will, and there are a few that won't, uh, but we certainly will accept the, uh, the application. Okay, someone's asking about guiding adjudication committees regarding eligibility. 
Yes. Now, you know, specifically with respect to racialized students, equity seeking groups, that's becoming baked into the peer review process, uh, not just for students, but everybody. Uh, there are now uh, requirements around training that are being put in place by the previous minister for all peer reviewers, uh, members of committees. Uh, all need to go through a training. Uh, we collect the data, as I said before. Uh, SHRC has a system of observers within, within its committees uh, to, to watch and see how things progress, what kind of comments are made by committee members, what, excuse me, what kind of biases may be built in uh, to the committee process. So that's absolutely all ongoing. Um, and then you're asking two students having to work more to support their education not able to be le build leadership opportunities, right. So here we're having a very interesting discussion around what leadership means and how we measure that, not just in SHRC, but across the council. So where you see you know, demonstrating leadership or the need to demonstrate leadership, we believe that peer reviewers and the agencies had a very, um, I think, restricted view of what that constitutes. Uh, and I think they were looking for very traditional things. Right. So you were volunteering for the children's aid or you were leading, you know, uh, training for, uh, you know, skiers with with disabilities and so forth. And I think what we're trying to do now is to build that um, uh, through through recognition that leadership can be exercised in many, many, many other ways. It may be in your family responsibilities. It may be in the way you handle uh, yourself you know, during during a pandemic. Uh, or how you provide help and guidance to others. So we're trying to build out that leadership category to, to better reflect the reality of everyone and in particular everyone during these particular, particular times. Storytellers, yep, rock and roll, it's here. Um, I love storytellers, my favorite thing all year because I get the, they, I think they're trying to stop me from hosting it because you know they wanna get the president off the stage but I, I, I have to confess, it's just, the thing I like the most to do during the course of the year. And I wait all year to get up there and just watch these folks do their little presentations and just huge impact. Um, three minutes, that's all they get. But it's some of them are just absolutely phenomenal. So yeah, it's it's back, it's here. I don't have all the dates, but it will be on the, uh, the website. And I see there's a question about research expenses. Yes. And this is one of the things we're now looking at. Um, uh, and I mentioned this in my comments and I can elaborate a bit. So uh, when you get your doctoral fellowship, you know, you get, you get the dollars, you get the check and then it's up to you to kind of figure out, you know, how you're going to, how you're going to portion that. Um, and it's not a lot. I, I pointed this out and I hate to make everybody feel bad, but it's, the reality is just not, not, not funny. I mean, I got my first um, doctoral fellowship from Shirk in 1980 and it was $17,000. I felt like a millionaire. Uh, you know, I had just won the lottery. And right now, what's the average? Around 21. So it, please, I mean, nobody knows better than, than me, you know, what the issues are. And, and what we've opted for is not to increase the amounts to try and fund more students. So we have to look at that, number one. Number two, um, we have to look at how we build in, especially for our students, in social sciences and humanities, their own research expenditure, expenditure lines, uh, because you know you're not working in labs, as you say, um, uh, Julian. I guess it is. I was in your in your question, your great question. You know, we, we, in other disciplines, you know, they're working in labs. Other profs are finding ways to pay for things through their grants, and it's just not our reality. So this is totally, totally, totally part of what we're going to be looking at. I, I'm so happy because I see it all the time that students are paying out of pocket. Whether yep. they're and they're not on this is out of their pocket literally, yep. even if they're not on you know and it's like that to me as a coming from a biological background that just seems yeah absolutely it really sure does. sure does so that's a big piece and if I can follow up on that I feel vaguely exposed because I'm the only one who's turned the camera on <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you Julian um, <laughs> um, there's a particular pocket or version of this um, where this is even more glaring and that's um, we're just beginning uh, um, good discussions around campus about uh, reviewing our uh, Indigenous graduate fellowship yeah. and we're finding that um, Indigenous methodologies very often with their focus on very deep community interactions um, cost more 
There's travel yeah. back and forth, often to remote communities. And that is an area where this, this absence of research funding is particularly glaring. Um, yeah. There's lots of other areas in the Shirk world where that's also the case because people have to go far or they, they right, or maybe the surveys are expensive. But that's an area that where that seems particularly common uh, and where students are often funding uh, very much out of pocket and which then obviously has an impact on their ability to fund their life for us in a place like Vancouver, uh, which is challenging to begin with. Uh, and so that would be an area um, that if there was an opportunity to to start, right, if, if anywhere, that would be the place to start uh, providing some of that research funding in my mind. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and it's, it, you know, we've tried to deal with this, you know, in ways that really um, kind of bend the rules, which isn't the way we should, you know, we should come at it directly. And one of the things we've heard, is, yes, the travel piece, the, the research cost piece in communities has to be recognized. The second piece is, you know, when you're there, you want to compensate people uh, for their time, for their efforts. You want to be able, in some cases, to hire people. Uh, and, you know, we've made that too difficult. And we're just now, we found ways to get around that, uh, but that's not the way to fix it. So they're currently across the agencies, we're looking at, you know, how to make that simpler and, and how to make sure that people can be appropriately compensated. There's also a data piece there, uh, Julian, I know it's not, not related to what you were saying, but one thing we have to understand if we're doing this kind of research, um, you know, everybody's talking about open science. Well, you know, open science is a totally other meaning if you're an indigenous person uh, and you live in an indigenous community and people are coming in and taking data from you. And we have to understand, you know, basically that those data, that communication, those oral histories, whatever, that participant observation, if that's all you're doing, those data, you know, they're owned by those people. Uh, and we need to recognize that better and we need to make sure that we treat data in the same way. Now, people always ask me, well, what are the implications of that for me using these data for my, for my thesis? And, and what I'm saying is, well, then these are things you need to nail down before you set one foot you know, in the community. You make sure you understand how this is going to work, because it's not like we used to do in the old days and really cannot do again this sort of you know, helicopter research. You, know, you land in, take the stuff and fly out, like forget it. So that's another big piece. So that has a cost also. So you're, you're totally right. And that's part of our broader thinking around uh, indigenous research as we as we slowly move, you know, to do the right thing. And one more dimension is time, right? Um, they're yeah. time intensive methods very often. Yeah. Um, and so when we're looking at metrics like time to completion, which is a problematic one across disciplines in any case, that's also a pocket where where the yeah. methodology produces longer duration totally. and is fully justified and, and in fact desirable that way. Um, and that has costs again. Yeah, to totally agree. I, I'm really glad to hear this, uh, Ted, because I, I, it's, it's a really important thing and I would it's, encourage you to <laughs> carry on. Well, I mean, the only caution I make is, you know, nothing gets fixed in a day. You know that yeah. we all know that. But I think, you know, our, our, our direction is good. Uh, our understanding is good. And it's just really a question of moving through and doing what we can as we can to kind of correct some of this stuff. But I am serious, you know, around around budget 2022. Uh, and the role of training and addressing some of these issues and the government's willingness to listen, I think, you know, this is going to be a big, big direction for us. There's a new question. Mm -hmm. Laurence. Okay. In the spirit of funding more students, will there be discussions about reviewing the three categories? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, uh, Laurence. Um, it's, uh, it is part of the review that we're doing. Uh, I was here alive when, when, the Va when the Vanier and the Banting were being contemplated by the uh, Harper government. And uh, I was working at Western at the time as VP for research. But I remember my comment was, you know, you're going to create different classes of, of, uh, of uh, students and postdocs if you do this. You know, people are going to be working beside each other where the pay differential is enormous. The, the position, my position on this is, and I don't, depending on whether you hold a band or not, you may not like this, but, you know, I think, I think we need to have a very, very good look uh, at the funding levels across all of the programs and across the councils and make sure they're commensurate with the needs of students. So that is also being looked at, absolutely. Uh, and even within agencies, you know, the CGS versus the SHRC. Uh, doctoral fellowships and so forth. You know, we have to make sure that these things, people understand the values, understand if there are going to be any differences in values, why those are there, 
uh, and we'll, we'll need to uh, move forward with that. And that's a part and parcel of the review that we're doing right now. So that's just really, really a great, a great question. Can I can I build on that? And and it's uh, well, it's not really, but it's related. Uh, and something that we've advocated for through CAGS is: Are you will you consider um, paying international students? Okay, so that's an I, interesting. I, let me one. just say at UBC yeah. this incoming year, PhD students seventy percent are international. So so there are two two sides to this discussion. Um, and I'm just going to give them both to you. And, and, and by saying this, please, you know, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying that these two things are out there. Um, the number one thing out there is saying we've got to get out and we've got to recruit the best students. So we should make all of our programming open to international students. So if you want to bring an international student, you should be able to get them in the stream for a Shirk doctoral fellowship, you know, from the get go. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, there, there's certainly a, a lot of sympathy for that. And that's partly the rationale, partly in good measure, the rationale for the Vanniers, for example. Um, the, the other thinking is that, in fact, there are lots of students and a lot of talent in Canada that we are not exploiting properly, that we are not getting at, uh, and that we should do a whole better job of finding these students and getting them into graduate streams. Um, and some of this comes from uh, immigrant communities, you know, people who have arrived, who are more likely, I've seen, you know, in research I've seen, children of immigrants much more likely to go on to graduate school, university and graduate school, uh, than children non immigrants. So are we doing a good job of, of tapping that? Um, and, and the second piece is, you know, the taxpayer argument uh, of that is that how much do we want to invest in bringing students into Canada? And how much, and, and believe me, you know, politicians are quite sensitive to this. Uh, at the provincial and the federal level. So what I'm saying is that's all out there. And we, as we look at solutions for this, I think we want to have a balance. I mean, my personal view is you've got to be able to get out there effectively and recruit. So we've been thinking about this and how we make this easier. Um, but we've also got to make sure that uh, we're able to, to best, you know, take advantage of and support uh, Canadian students who, who may, you know, be inclined consider graduate training, but for various reasons, you know, may opt to, uh, to take another path. I hearing, that was as tactful as I could make I'm it. I'm hearing non-committal at this time. <laughs> yeah, I would say, let's just keep, I, you know, I, I do have views on this and, and, and I do think it needs to be balanced. You know, I'm radically in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, I think we were we were suggesting maybe just a, a portion. Of well, there you go. So the that, that, that's so that's excellent. And, you know, I, I wanted to mention that uh, my colleagues, you know, Rachel and Darlene are here today from my office and we're taking notes on all of this and we're monitoring the chat. So it'll all go back into the into the discussion here. Um, oh, a question about Laurentian. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I gotta I, I have to be a bit careful as we're privy to some discussions that are ongoing. Um, was this really your question, Ian, or was this? Uh... <laughs> it, it was, and I, I didn't want to, just in case you weren't comfortable answering, I didn't want to say it out loud, but, and I understand if you can't. So, I mean, what I would say about that is that we're working very carefully with Laurentian, and we're trying to figure out exactly who's impacted by this and, and how we can help. Um, one thing we know for sure, and one thing I can tell you that Laurentian has assured us, is that any students or anyone who is being paid from a grant has been protected, at least they're telling us. If I'm wrong, you can tell me I'm wrong. That's fine. I'd love to know it because we would not be very happy. Um, but what we've been told is that any students or anyone who is being paid through a grant, you know, will continue to be supported as they have. Um, so if you have a fellowship or you have uh, some other type of support, you're being paid through a grant, you will be prioritized. The, the main impact here is really on the, uh, well, it's twofold. Initially, it was on the faculty who were not able to access their research grants. Uh, that money is theirs. We, we consider it to be theirs. The institution will need to make it whole uh, at some point uh, when this process is finished. Um, so it will continue to flow into the research uh, system. Um, the more distressing thing is when faculty were let go, which is just an awful, you know, thing to contemplate, uh, personally, and, and I can imagine, you know, what kind of impact this has in the community, uh, what will happen then, you know, to students who are being paid from grants they held, they might no longer have access to, uh, where will that research money go? Our view is that it needs to stay in the grant to the purpose, uh, that was intended, um, and those discussions are now ongoing, but we will deal with those 
one by one by one by one by one, you know, as we move forward uh, in order to make sure that the rights of, of faculty and students are protected. And I'm not sure if he got your follow up there, Ian, about the Sorry. Do you want to build on that at all? You're just the people that are. Oh, uh, what's your students who are thinking? Well, what am I going to say? <laughs> um, look, uh, you know, we suspect there, there, there are probably a number of institutions out there that may be having some difficulty. This may be the, the most drastic uh, situation or scenario. I think like anywhere, like anything, I think people need to do their homework. Uh, and understand, you know, what's at stake or what risks that, that may be involved. Uh, but, you know, I mean, this is Canada. Our institutions are, 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 are very solid in terms of educational quality, um, have a great record in terms of, of training, you know, and, and research output and publication, you know, across the, the network. I, I think it's, it's really, it really becomes, um, you know, important to, to make your decision based on your understanding of the situation. So get as much information as you can. Thanks, Ted. Julian, I think, has a question. <laughs> if I'm still feeling exposed, but um, Ted, if I can circle <laughs> back to the, the sort of post-COVID adjudication question. Um, and so I, I work with Susan at, at UBC, and I ra I've raised this with all the adjudicators in, the, in our various committees and said, what are we going to do in two years and three years? And the answer almost always is, well, we need a bit more narrative. Uh, you know, we need a paragraph on what has been the COVID impact on the applicant. And, and I think that that's good, but it runs counter to another long-term intention, which is tied to EDI goals, mm -hmm. which is to remove the, the intransparent, personalistic, the, you know, the reliance on supervisors to, to frame things, to raise issues. And I, I'm at a bit of a loss uh, of, of how we'll be able to handle that, that mm -hmm. we certainly build in that paragraph, please explain um, how COVID impacted has your trajectory, what are your grades, that's great. But that's not going to come out even. And when and and I hear you on on collecting data on application rates and all that. But as you immediately said yourself, um, that's not going to tell us the whole story either. Um, so, where does that leave us? Um, exactly. And and sadly, in a way, because I mean, these are the two primary uh, sources of information that we will have, right? Uh, in the case of the specific applicants, explaining their situation and in the data that we're able to glean. Now, there are some surveys. Um, also, so the data, you know, can, can come from application uh, data and from analysis of application and submission and award data. Um, there are some surveys that we're looking at that have been done. Uh, a lot, most of them so far with faculty, but I believe there's some with students where we're, we're getting information. We also meet with you. Uh, we meet with, with Universities Canada. We meet with the U15 uh, VPs and, and the regional uh, uh, organizations representing VPs research and, and so forth. So we do get a lot of information there. I have to say though, Julian, a lot of cases, we, we, we hear you in terms of what you're saying and the accommodations that need to be made and the problems with people, you know, uh, having to move to online research or, this, or, or the individual faculty who have, have responsibilities at home or in, in caregiving. Um, but our issue there is, you know, we as, as SHRC or as agencies may not be in the best position to deal with those, uh, that a lot of times it comes back to the institution uh, to deal with because you're on the ground. I mean, you're, you're, you live with them. I mean, you understand this. So, so we will continue to do our best and we will continue to take your recommendations, but it has to fall within our remit, which is the other piece. And, you know, we, we were contemplating a funding program that would help people, for example, to get back on track with research. And we went back, you know, from a legal perspective and from discussion with the, um, you know, with the other council presidents, you know, and from our own ministry, it was like, you don't have a mandate to do that. You know, you don't have a mandate to provide research support per se or only. You have a mandate to fund research um, and therefore you could support research as projects are being contemplated or programs of research are being contemplated, but you can't just fund, you know, somebody to do something to help them do research. So these are the kind of complications that exist and where the government is trying to 
fill those gaps and where we have to work with all of you. Um, you mentioned some of you mentioned a survey. Jeff mentioned a survey at SFU. We do have data from other universities that we're getting, and we're just going to continue to to try and uh, move forward in these through these discussions to design what we can design, uh, and to provide solutions that we're able to provide, or flexibility that we're able to provide to try and help us through this whole miserable thing. Thanks so much, Ted. Over to you, Ian, maybe to, to wrap up or? Yeah, we've come to the end of the hour and it looks like uh, we've exhausted all of our questions. So <laughs> thanks so much, Ted, for, uh, for filling us in on Shirk's plans for the future and for, uh, for listening to some of our, our community members talk about their challenges. Um, thanks also for Julian for being a, an honorary panelist uh, <laughs> at this session, uh, filling in nicely the, the four quadrants here. Um, but thanks again, Ted. And if we could maybe uh, stay in touch, uh, if there's any questions sure. uh, that weren't answered, and we can make sure to relay those on to our to our members. But uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Hood. Appreciate you coming, and as well, uh, Dr. Porter and uh, everyone else who joined us today. Okay, I go. Uh, merci, colleague. It's been really, really enlightening. Great questions. It's always great just to see everybody, or at least know you're there, <laughs> right? I mean, there is a world out there. We are connecting, and we yeah. will always stay connected. So, thanks a really, lot, folks. Really appreciate it, Ted. Thank you. Okay, take care. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bonne journée. Thanks again, Susan. Oh, my pleasure. It was uh, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. we got a little it slow was... at the beginning, but I think we yeah. got it. <laughs> but we got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was good. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Susan. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.